In 1931, while the world's fastest trains fought to hit 60 miles per hour, a German engineer unveiled a machine that broke every expectation a slender aluminum-bodied railcar pushed by a giant spinning aircraft propeller. The Schienen Zeppelin shattered the rail speed record, traveling at 143 miles per hour, faster than most planes of its era. Yet no passengers ever bought a ticket. Railway officials nicknamed it Decapitator, and platforms banned it as too dangerous to approach. If this was the future, how did it end chopped up for scrap before its promise was ever realized? Franz Kruckenberg never saw the world the way railway men did. While most engineers in the 1920s in Germany were obsessed with heavier locomotives and more powerful steam engines, Kruckenberg spent his days at the Friedrichshafen air shipyards working on zeppelins that floated above the clouds. His hands shaped the aluminum skeletons of airships, learning how every ounce of weight mattered and how a streamlined hull could slip through the sky with almost no resistance. The Zeppelin was a cathedral of lightness. Canvas stretched over a lattice of metal, every rivet counted, every curve tested in the wind. Kruckenberg's obsession with air and drag was not just technical, it was almost philosophical. He believed the future belonged to machines that mastered the flow of air, not those that fought it with brute force. On the Zeppelin, he saw how a rounded nose and a smooth skin could turn a wall of wind into a gentle caress. The rails, to him, were just another kind of runway. After the First World War, Kruckenberg watched as the Deutsche Reichsbahn poured money into steam locomotives that weighed hundreds of tons and shook the ground beneath them. The trains were powerful, but they were prisoners of friction and mass. He saw wasted energy in every piston stroke, every cloud of coal smoke. To Kruckenberg, the real enemy was not the limits of steel or steam, but the old habits of thinking. In 1922, he left the world of airships and founded his own engineering office in Heidelberg. His idea was radical, take the lessons of the Zeppelin and apply them to the rails. Build a train that was as light as an airship, with an aluminum frame and a canvas skin. Strip out the velvet seats, the heavy wood, the needless ornament. Let the air, not the rails, do the work. Aviation historians still talk about Kruckenberg as the man who tried to turn the railway into a low-flying aircraft. One of them put it simply, Kruckenberg did not see a train, he saw a hull. His vision was to make the rails a place for flight, not just for rolling. The Schienen Zeppelin would be his proof, a machine that owed more to the sky than to the ground. Steam locomotives in the 1920s were massive machines, but their size was a trap. The Deutsche Reichsbahn's express engines tipped the scales at over 70 tons, with axle loads reaching 20 tons each. Every pound of metal pressed down on the rails, causing wear and limiting how fast a train could safely move. The real enemy was not just weight, it was friction. Steel wheels on steel rails create only a thin band of grip, known as adhesion. Once a locomotive tried to go faster than about 60 miles per hour, the wheels began to slip before all the engine's power could be used. Even on a dry day, the best a steam engine could hope for was an adhesion coefficient of about 0.22. On wet rails, that dropped even lower. At 60 miles per hour, a typical express train faced a wall of resistance. Rolling friction chewed up energy, but air drag was the real killer. For a non-streamlined steam train, the drag coefficient soared above one. The faster the train went, the more the air fought back. To push a heavy express past 60, the locomotive needed to deliver over a thousand kilowatts just to overcome resistance, but only a fraction of that power made it to the rails before the wheels spun uselessly. Kruckenberg saw a dead end. No matter how powerful the locomotive, the laws of physics pinned everything to that narrow contact patch. The rails could only take so much before they lost their grip. Steam engineers responded by piling on more weight, but that just damaged the tracks and made acceleration even harder. He started running the numbers. A traditional engine, dragging hundreds of tons, wasted most of its energy fighting friction and slip. But what if you could cut the weight to a fraction, streamline the body until air resistance dropped by 70%, and most radical of all, abandon wheel-driven propulsion entirely. 
The answer lay in thrust. An aircraft propeller powered by a BMW V12 could push a 20-ton railcar past the friction wall. With no need for heavy drive wheels or complex transmissions, all the engine's power went straight into forward motion. The rails became a guide, not a limit. To the old guard at the Reichsbahn, this was heresy. They trusted the weight of steel and the bite of wheels. Krokenberg saw only wasted energy and missed opportunity. If the challenge was to go faster, friction had to be defeated, not with brute force, but with flight principles. The Schienen Zeppelin would be his answer, a machine that ignored the old rules and set its sights on the open air. Krokenberg's Schienen Zeppelin broke from railway tradition at its core. Instead of heavy steel and dense wood, his team chose an aluminum truss borrowed straight from airship construction. The chassis formed a lattice of slim girders, each one drilled to shed every possible ounce. Over this skeletal frame, they stretched fireproof canvas, a material that weighed a fraction of the oak and iron found in standard carriages. The result was a body that looked more at home in the sky than on rails, echoing the Zeppelin's own hull. Measuring just over 85 feet, the Schienen Zeppelin was long but astonishingly light, barely 20 tons. For context, a typical steam locomotive of the era tipped the scales at over 60 tons, not counting its tender or carriages. Two men could rock the Zeppelin's body on its axles. Every joint and panel was shaped to hold firm at speed, but never to add unnecessary weight. With less mass pressing down, rolling resistance dropped sharply. The lighter the shell, the less energy lost to friction and gravity, and the more power left for speed. Inside, the design was stripped to essentials. There were no plush seats or ornate woodwork, just bare aluminum frames with thin cushions bolted directly to the floor. The walls resembled an airship gondola, canvas stretched over ribs, painted a sterile white. Windows were fixed glass, sealed tight against the rush of air at high velocity. The interior felt closer to a prototype aircraft than any luxury train. This was not just about saving weight. Every kilogram counted toward the goal of reaching speeds no train had touched. Krokenberg's aviation experience shaped every decision. He knew that strength came from clever geometry, not brute force. The aluminum truss acted as a bridge, distributing stress and flexing to absorb the pounding of the rails at high speed. But building so light brought new risks. The shell had to survive sudden stops, engine vibration, and the twisting forces of a body hurtling down the track at 140 miles per hour. Every choice was a trade-off between speed and safety. The success of this radical shell would determine if the Schienen Zeppelin could carry the power needed for its next leap, fitting a true aircraft engine and mounting a propeller aiming to turn the train into a bullet on rails. The Schienen Zeppelin's leap beyond friction began at the rear, where aviation muscle met railway ambition. Instead of a drive shaft turning steel wheels, Franz Krokenberg installed a BMW 6512 aircraft engine, 46 liters of displacement, 12 cylinders in perfect symmetry, and a power output of 600 horsepower. This was not the gentle chug of a steam locomotive. It was a roar, sharp and relentless, the sound of a heavy bomber at full throttle. Mounted just ahead of the tail, the engine turned a wooden propeller 2.8 meters across. Ash wood chosen for strength and flexibility, carved into four blades for the first trials and two blades for the record run. The propeller was not just for show. It spun at thousands of revolutions per minute, transforming every drop of gasoline into pure thrust. The drive shaft was angled downward by seven degrees, a subtle tilt that forced the nose of the Schienen Zeppelin onto the rails. That downward force kept the lightweight body from lifting at speed, and it turned the rails into a guide rather than a prison. Instead of fighting for grip like a steam engine whose wheels slip on steel, the Zeppelin pushed itself forward with the same principle that sends airplanes skyward. Thrust bypassed the old enemy, adhesion. Traditional locomotives could only deliver as much power as their wheels could grip, but the Schienen Zeppelin ignored that limit entirely. The full force of the BMW engine went straight into the air, 
propelling the 20-ton body with no transmission losses and no wasted energy and friction. At low speeds, the propeller's bite was fierce, but as velocity climbed, drag became the only barrier. The streamlined hull, shaped by Krokenberg's airship instincts, cut through the wind with a drag coefficient far below anything else on rails. This was not a train in the old sense. It was a low-flying aircraft, its propeller at head height, its engine tuned for maximum output, its body so light that two men could rock it on its axles. The rails provided direction, but the real work was done by the air. Every component was tuned for speed, the engine's 600 horsepower, the propeller's broad sweep, the downward thrust, all working together to push past the friction wall. The result was a machine that could accelerate smoothly past 60, 90, 120 kilometers per hour with nothing to hold it back but the drag of the atmosphere itself. The Schienen Zeppelin was ready to test the limits of what a train could be, armed with the power of flight and the single-minded goal of speed. Throttle in hand, the operator watched the pressure gauges flicker, waiting for the signal. The rails ahead stretched empty, a silver ribbon vanishing into the haze. With a nod from the trackside official, he eased the lever forward. The BMW V12 engine behind him woke with a hard-edged snarl, its 12 pistons firing in perfect sequence. The propeller at the rear blurred from across into a spinning disc, carving the air into a vortex. At first, the Sheenan Zeppelin rolled forward with the quiet confidence of a machine built for flight. The lightweight frame responded instantly, no heavy mass to fight inertia. The first milestone came quickly, 60 kilometers per hour. For a steam train, this was the edge of safety. The point where wheels began to slip and the whole locomotive strained against invisible barriers. Here, it was just a gentle surge. The operator nudged the throttle again. The nose dipped ever so slightly, the propeller's downward thrust pinning the car to the rails. 90 kilometers per hour arrived in a matter of seconds, not minutes. The wind noise grew sharper, a constant hiss along the canvas skin. The operator's hands tightened on the controls. The gauges showed the engine barely breaking a sweat. The propeller, angled seven degrees, kept the car glued to the track even as the speedometer's needle swept higher. At 120 kilometers per hour, the world outside the windows began to blur. Fields and telegraph poles snapped past so quickly they seemed to dissolve into streaks. The sensation was not like riding a train. It was more like low-level flight, the rails serving only as a guide. Inside the cockpit, the operator called out the numbers to the engineer at his side. Each checkpoint a confirmation that the calculations were holding true. There was no shudder, no sense of strain. The aluminum truss absorbed the vibrations, the rubber-damped axles smoothing out the track joints. The only feedback came from the rising pitch of the engine and the deepening roar from the rear. With every increment, the Sheenan Zeppelin felt more stable, not less. The operator's confidence grew. He eased the throttle open once more, eyes fixed on the next milestone, knowing the real test was still ahead. On June 21, 1931, the Sheenan Zeppelin reached its moment of truth. The straightaway between Karstedt and Dergenthin had been cleared and checked by Deutsche Reichsbahn officials, their stopwatches and calibrated speedometers ready. As the throttle opened, the BMW V12 liquid cooled aircraft engine roared to full power and the ash propeller at the rear became nothing but a spinning disc. The lightweight aluminum hull surged forward, slicing through the air with almost no resistance. The numbers climbed 60, 90, 120, 140. Then for the first time in railway history, the speedometer swept past 230 km per hour on 143 miles per hour. The official record, 230.2 km per hour, was confirmed by the railway's timing team, their instruments checked and rechecked. This was faster than any car in Germany. Most cars topped out at 40 miles per hour, and it was nearly as quick as the fastest aircraft flying overhead. Farmers in the fields saw only a silver blur. The Schienen Zeppelin covered the distance between Hamburg and Berlin in just 98 minutes a stretch that took steam expresses over three hours. The press called it the world's fastest train. Krokenberg's dream had become reality. The rails were no longer a prison of friction. 
For a moment, the impossible seemed routine. But as the Sheenan Zeppelin coasted to a stop, the mood shifted. The propeller, still spinning at thousands of revolutions per minute, created a hurricane at platform level. Hats flew, skirts whipped, and anyone standing too close felt the blast of wind and grit. Railway officials, who had watched the record with pride, now looked uneasy. A safety inspector, notebook in hand, called the propeller a meat slicer, a name that would stick. The risk was obvious. The spinning blade sat at head height, unguarded, just a few feet from where passengers would stand. Even after the engine cut, the propeller took minutes to spin down, its blurred edges still dangerous enough to sever anything in their path. Reports from later test runs described station staff clearing platforms before the Zeppelin arrived, warning that the prop wash could send loose objects flying or worse. Engineers debated whether the achievement justified the hazard. Some called it a marvel, others a disaster waiting to happen. The speed record was secure, but the Sheenan Zeppelin's future on public rails was suddenly in question. Kruckenberg had proven that aerodynamics could shatter every record, but he had also built a machine that terrified the very people it was meant to serve. Today, speed records fall to maglevs and bullet trains, but every leap forward still walks the line between brilliance and safety. The Sheenan Zeppelin's legacy warns that innovation can outpace safety when ambition blinds us to risk. We're still asking, how far will we push, and at what cost? Share your thoughts below.